you everybody. Um, I'm going to just spend the next five minutes telling you um, a story about um, a grassroots science outreach initi initiative that myself and my colleague uh, at the Institute of Zoology and ZSL developed a few years ago. <laughs> um, it's called Soapbox Science and it speaks for itself about bringing science uh, to the people, to the streets. Now we are inundated with opportunities to learn about science meet scientists in the UK today. We have uh, science <coughs> festivals coming out of our ears. We have uh, cafe science peaks in almost every major town in the UK. Um, we have public science events where people can go and listen to lectures by scientists. We even have science comedians who will um, try to help the public understand about science. <coughs> but all of these ventures, fabulous though they are, they target a particular niche of and those are people who have already chosen to learn about science. So really they're preaching to the converted. The audiences for these initiatives are already interested in science, they're already passionate about science. Soapbox science is all about trying to reach the people who haven't necessarily had the opportunity to engage with, um, with science, to learn about science, to uh, develop that passion for science. <coughs> So um, it's very simple, we put scientists on soapboxes and we stand them on the streets, um, currently in, the, uh, in London but we're hoping to expand. There's nothing new and fancy about this, we don't claim to have patented it in any way. Um, it's based on the, uh, the famous format uh, developed at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park in London, which has been running for over a hundred years now and it uh, was a real uh, arena for public um, communication and uh, it really revolutionised Victorian Britain uh, in terms of civil liberties and promoting democracy. So Soapbox Science has uh, stolen this idea and taken it to a new level. So Soapbox Science is basically one story that consists of two acts. Now the first act I've already told you about is the ethos that science is for everybody. We want science to reach the people who don't have the opportunity to learn about science, the people whose social environment might not be conducive to helping them learn about science. Uh, we want to reach the people who don't have the time or the money or the inclination to go to a science festival. So science really is for everybody. But the second act is a bit more of a serious political issue, and that is that there is a, there is a loss of women from the scientific career ladder. So uh, girls are actually really interested in, in, in science. There's no problem in getting girls engaged in science, even in the physical sciences, at school. And indeed, at the undergraduate level, um, women love doing science. But it's after that point, after the postdoc level, that the, the, the proportion of women in science drops, such that only about 10% of professors, science professors in the UK, are actually women. So soapbox science is kind of a two-tiered effect. We're trying to bring science to everybody, but we're also trying to raise the profile of women in science and promote the visibility of women in science to encourage the next generation of women in science and also to in influence their social environment in which they <coughs> are growing up. And we've been fortunate enough to be sponsored by all these fabulous organisations, particularly by the L'Oreal for Women in Science programme and also ZSL. So what do we do? Uh, we put female scientists on soapboxes in very public, high foot formal parts of the UK. Um, so far we've done it, we tried it at Speaker's Corner and we got thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently you can only speak at Speaker's Corner on a Sunday. We tried it on a Monday, I think. Um, so so uh, the South Bank is now our main venue for this and it's been taking place over the last three years in the summer on, on the South Bank. Uh, we've had a range of scientists um, from all disciplines of science, but including many of those who have an environmental agenda to their research. Does it work? Well, the media love us. Um, we get high coverage in uh, the broadsheets, on online, and also in the science uh, literature as well. Nature and Science have covered our events. Um, and interestingly, they're interested in not in our mode of communication, um, but more the fact that we put women in that mode of communication. The public seem to love us. Our evaluation uh, suggests that we have a high hit rate. Uh, we reach over a thousand people in just a three-hour event. Uh, families will stay 
listening to scientists for, on average, 24 minutes. Um, over half of our audience are unsolicited, and that's great, because that's what we want. We want to reach the people who didn't intend to come and learn about science. And, and they all said it was really great, and they'd come again. And most importantly, the majority could tell us a fact that they'd actually learned from those scientists that day. <coughs> okay, so the media think it's work, it worked. The public think it's work, it worked. Let's see if you think it worked. Oh no, that doesn't look like a girl. Oh, oh there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Incredibly nervous. I had hardly any sleep last night. It's not the sort of thing that I normally do at all. I've heard people have got trampolines and people are going to have people dancing and, and you know, you sort of think, ooh, what am I going to do to get my feel going to be? So, I'm penguin. We'll have to think about it. I don't want to call him Percy, it's too obvious. <laughs> Yes, the trampoline. So I spent quite a while trying to find ways of explaining the elastic interaction. So that's what I'm going to be demonstrating with the trampoline. I've been a bit nervous, I have to admit. physics perspective. What I look at is the way hydrogen causes problems inside metals. Ships, reactors, oil rigs, materials that are used in huge giant structures. Have a guess what the coldest temperature ever recorded is. It was recorded in Antarctica. Isn't it like something like minus 40? This urchin is actually exactly the same material as this crystal here. Okay, so how does that animal do that and can we use that chemistry, can we copy that in the lab to make some fun? I'm going to work out how many bacteria are in our food. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, and I think they've had to drag me off, so so it was not nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. If you went back 200 years ago, then the temperatures in the UK were much cooler. But most insects can't move very well if it gets too cold. <laughs> if you watch a movie, you see, you know, James Bond standing there while a spider crawls up his arm. Everyone cringes in the cinema. So these parts of your brain are active in a similar way as if you were feeling smart. They were interested and they were asking questions and they were engaged. And it, I couldn't have expected anything like it. And it was so exciting. It's such a great and different way to communicate about our work to, to the public. And it's awesome. It's truly awesome.